Welcome to this webinar today called Basics of Type 2 Diabetes and Metabolism. My name is Robbie Tyson. I'm an accredited practicing dietitian and credentialed diabetes educator. So in this webinar today, we're going to be talking about several different things. Type 2 Diabetes Basics, uh, the body with and without diabetes. So what's actually happening when somebody's digesting carbohydrates and they don't have diabetes and what happens when they digest carbohydrates and they do and what goes wrong in that situation. And then we'll look at some ways to improve the body's physiology um, by different changes such as physical activity and diet uh, to tackle some of those things that are going wrong when someone's living with type 2 diabetes. So just an overview of what type 2 diabetes is or a refresher. Uh, type 2 diabetes may be prevented but not cured. So basically the pancreas isn't producing enough insulin and or the insulin that is being secreted uh, doesn't work properly. So it's just not quite working well enough. And that's known as insulin resistance. It accounts for about 85 to 90% of all people currently living with diabetes. And we know that the management uh, similar to pre-diabetes is physical activity and uh, diet changes and then uh, medication, whether that be oral uh, hypoglycemic agents uh, tablets or insulin or other injectables that we have looked at in other uh, webinars. Type 1 diabetes, on the other hand, it cannot be prevented um, or cured. So in this case, it's an autoimmune um, issue that's happening where the insulin producing cells of the body are destroyed by the body's own immune system. So there isn't any insulin produced at all. Uh, it's commonly diagnosed in younger uh, children um, and also in young adults. So in order to survive, uh, that insulin that isn't being produced by the pancreas needs to be replaced. So insulin injections uh, four times a day or a pump would need to be initiated. Getting back to type 2 diabetes, we're looking at some of the risk factors here that can't be changed. So <clears throat> non-modifiable risk factors such as age. Uh, as we get older, our risk for diabetes, uh, type 2 diabetes diagnosis increases. And gender, males are more likely to be diagnosed with diabetes than females. Ethnicity, so different ethnic backgrounds are more likely to be predisposed to uh, type 2 diabetes. So those from an Asian or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander background, for example. Uh, those with a strong family history or direct relative, uh, mother, father, brother, sister, are uh, high risk for type 2 diabetes. And gestational diabetes uh, in a previous pregnancy is also increases the risk by about 50% for a future diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. Um, and polycystic ovarian syndrome as well is also a risk uh, for type 2 diabetes. Now, risk factors that can be changed, so heading towards lifestyle factors here. Um, so if we start at the top, high blood pressure, we know that the maintenance of uh, appropriate blood pressure is just as important as blood glucose levels, um, and it is a risk factor for um, type 2 diabetes, along with smoking. So smoking uh, really damages all parts of the body. However, in terms of type 2 diabetes, it really interferes with how well insulin works. So a person smoking would have an increased uh, insulin resistance, meaning the insulin that's floating around the body wouldn't work quite as well as somebody who doesn't smoke. Uh, sedentary lifestyle, so inactivity, not much physical activity or movement. This might be because of injury or illness or limited capacity. Uh, it might be because of uh, just general lifestyle choices or employment uh, if living a, in a sedentary uh, job. However, some of those things can be managed and changed to increase um, movement and decrease sitting time is a big one there. Overweight, so being overweight uh, can increase the risk of diabetes based on the fact that the excess blood, uh, fat sorry, around the organs tends to interfere with how well the insulin in the body works. And high fat and high cholesterol levels, similar to overweight, and then that extra fat in the blood, uh, that does require insulin to get out of the blood and into the cells of the body for it to be either used as energy or stored. And if that there's too much in the blood, then the insulin that's on board tends to be interrupted uh, or affected, should I say, and it doesn't work quite as well. So the extra fat in the blood just interfering with how well that insulin works. So if we look at some common signs and symptoms, well, excessive thirst uh, and feeling tired are quite common. 
and excessive thirst goes with frequent urination. So the rationale behind that is that the extra glucose in the blood, uh, the body notices that and tends to try and flush it out through the urine. Uh, with the extra urination becomes the, becomes the excessive thirst and that cycle continues. Feeling tired, well, that's re resulting in all that glucose that should be in the cells of the body to provide energy, uh, more of that being in the blood where it, where it uh, shouldn't be. So feelings of lethargy are quite common. Excessive hunger, again, those normal um, sensors that we would get or sen that the body would notice be being that the blood glucose level is lower would indicate that um, we're hunger hungry. In this case, the blood glucose levels are if they're high, uh, the glucose isn't getting where it needs to go. So the body's assuming that it's not getting enough energy and it's sending out these hunger signals. Blurry vision, well, we know that uh, high blood glucose levels can interfere and damage some of those small blood vessels in the body. And in the eyes, we do have small capillaries, blood vessels. So that damage to those blood vessels tends to result in blurry vision um, and an early sign and symptom of type two diabetes. Leg cramps as well, so uh, decrease in blood flow or ability for, for the blood to flow uh, appropriately. If it, can, it becomes a little thicker, I guess, with the excess um, solutes being the glucose in the blood. Headaches are common as well, along with itching on the skin, mood swings, and that can go hand in hand with the, the hunger as well. So if we don't have that energy or glucose getting where it needs to go. So excess glucose um, is a, well, it's a fuel for bacteria. So we know that it's going to promote any bacteria growth and that will um, slow down wound healing. Uh, this is quite common and commonly seen in uh, issues with the feet and then repeated infections, again, with that glucose being the fuel for the um, bacteria. Uh, why worry about type two diabetes? So we'll briefly have a look at some of the complications. Again, um, these are resulting not initially, but over time with elevated blood glucose levels. Cardiovascular disease, we've already said that the glucose in the blood tends to damage the inside of the blood vessels, such as the capillaries in the eyes, uh, kidneys and feet. However, in terms of cardiovascular disease, the same thing's happening on those larger vessels. The excess glucose in the blood tends to damage the inside of the wall and can uh, lead to plaque buildup and increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. We talked about damage to the eyes. Uh, this can lead to a longer term complication called retinopathy. Uh, small blood vessels in the kidneys can also be damaged and this is called nephropathy. Damage to the nerves in the feet usually is where it occurs and that's called neuropathy. Uh, problems with the feet and we've encountered this already if there's a, a cut and it's not noticed potentially because there's some damage to the nerves there, sensation might be reduced. Um, the cut may not heal very well because the excess glucose floating around in the blood tends to feed that bacteria and leads us on to slow wound healing. Again, excess um, glucose in the blood feeds bacteria and can lead to uh, problems with teeth and gums, meaning infections with the gums, gum disease, etc. And And for males, erectile dysfunction. Again, the high glucose levels in the blood can interfere with those small blood vessels. Other complications, we've already talked about the gum infections as well um, and susceptibility to infection with the increased blood glucose levels. Uh, Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This is insulin resistant uh, resulting and uh, also increased uh, risk due to increased waste, waste measurement because we've got the excess fat uh, potentially around some of those organs in the body uh, and leading to uh, what we call a fatty liver, but the non-alcoholic form. We know that um, there is significant effect on mood for people living with diabetes, given it's a chronic condition and we can't just uh, have a day off or give it away. So um, depression and other uh, states of low mood affect, affect about 50% of people living with diabetes. So we're gonna have a look at digestion um, in the body and what happens when someone's living with diabetes. And we've got a carbohydrate food here, which is bread. So if someone was living with diabetes and they were to consume this food, the body would um, break it down and the glucose released from the carbohydrate out of the stomach and into the bloodstream um, would then elevate the uh, blood glucose levels. 
So that glucose is going to the cells of the body where it needs to be. Insulin is the key that unlocks the lock to let that glucose into the cells of the body. And if in diabetes that key isn't working very well, which is what happens, the glucose in the blood tends to build up. So these locks become a little bit sticky and we call this insulin resistance. Glucose in the blood then becomes higher and higher. Uh, so two things happening here is the uh, pancreas isn't secreting quite enough insulin, but also the insulin that is floating around isn't working quite well. And that's that sticky lock and key system. And again, this is just it in animation form and a refresher. Uh, glucose is obviously the main fuel source for the body. In uh, type 2 diabetes, it becomes elevated because of those two things. And you'll see in this animation here, glucose at the moment going to the brain, cells of the body like the muscles. However, if this insulin key, which will become red in a moment, tends uh, not to work too, too well in diabetes, then that glucose in the blood tends to build up. So we're going to look later on at how we can improve that. Um, pancreas there showing that that's where the insulin is secreted. And as we said, that there is a decrease in the amount of pancreas, uh, sorry, insulin secreted from the pancreas for someone living with diabetes. So more on that now, if we can see this little um, diagram here showing the glucose all lining up to get into the cell doors, they're knocking on the door. However, the um, as we said, the insulin isn't working quite well. It's lying down on the job there, feeling a little bit overworked. The pancreas in the background is the factory. It produces the insulin. And as it tries to keep up with this uh, insulin resistance happening or the inability for the insulin to work, well, it secretes more and more pancreas and this cycle can so more and more insulin and this cycle continues to the point where the pancreas uh, becomes a little bit overworked and it can't quite secrete enough. And resulting fact is that the glucose the appropriate amount of glucose cannot enter the um, cells of the body. So how can this be improved? Well, the two main problems, we said that there's a decrease production of insulin. Around about 50% of insulin producing cells are inactive at diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. The other thing is the insulin that is being uh, secreted isn't working quite well enough. We call that insulin uh, resistance. So we need to try and increase the insulin sensitivity. So pancreas decreased insulin production, we said 50% at diagnosis. What are the solutions? Well, we can take medications which tell the pancreas to secrete more uh, insulin. Uh, and that's a medication such as diamicron, uh, the active ingredient glycoside there, and the group is the sulfonylurea. However, um, I guess the side effect of this is we're just telling the pancreas to secrete more and there may be a risk that um, we're overworking the pancreas more. So it's a good idea to include uh, some sort of lifestyle solutions as well that are going to help the insulin that's on board work a little bit better. So this medication is squeezing a little bit more insulin from the pancreas. Uh, physical activity and diet changes can help take that pressure off the, the pancreas though by not needing to, to make as much if the insulin is working better at that side of action where it goes through that cell door. So a bit more on that. So the locks on the cell doors are sticky, all right? So the insulin is trying to open that cell door. The locks become sticky. And another analogy is the boom, these are like boom gates on a car park. Normally there's one in and one out. However, if we do more physical activity, what that can do is help to put more boom gates on the cell door, meaning that we can have more glucose molecules going in to the cells where it needs to. So physical activity can help with that. Uh, so, so along with um, achieving and maintaining a healthy weight and um, ceasing or reducing smoking. So we said smoking before has a big effect on insulin sensitivity. So reducing it or ceasing it altogether is again going to help that insulin sensitivity and take the pressure off the pancreas. Overall, what are the three things we can do? Achieve and maintain a healthy weight. Less fat in the blood will mean that the insulin can work better. Less fat around the organs will mean the insulin can work better and take the pressure off the pancreas, meaning less will need to be um, secreted. We can participate in physical activity and obviously that will help in achieving and maintaining a healthy weight. 
the more physical activity we do, the better the body is at using insulin. So the more our insulin sensitivity is increased. So physical activity helps to add those boom gates, which open and close to let the glucose in and into the cell. Cease or reducing smoking. So these are the top three lifestyle things we can do. Having a look quickly now at blood glucose target ranges. So those at the moment, we've got here fasting for people living with type 2 diabetes. Target ranges, um, are, these ones are generalised only and should be individualised based on your, uh, obviously, a type of diabetes, medication, um, age, etc. Somewhere between 6 and 8 millimoles per litre, first thing in the morning or fasting is the range, the target range. And then two hours after a meal, we're looking at somewhere between six and 10. We know that blood glucose levels above 10 regularly are going to be um, likely to be causing uh, complications. One off blood glucose levels out of this range aren't so much. It's when we see a pattern of that developing above 10 or elevated fasting. Quickly looking at low blood glucose levels, so a hyperglycemic event, and hyper, so hyperglycemic event. So acute, it means the short term. So if we've got a blood glucose level that's less than four millimoles, the textbook says that that is a hyperglycemic event. Um, and we should treat that with the appropriate fast-acting glucose that we'll look at it in a moment. A hyperglycemic event at more than 15 millimoles per litre. So some advice around this for people living with type 2 diabetes is to rest, drink fluids that don't contain sugar, and maybe refrain from vigorous physical activity if it's above 15, because it can tend to increase the levels, uh, the stress from the activity. How do we treat a hypo? Well, if someone is taking um, insulin or that second line medication, Diamicron, then they could be at risk of a hypo. The other medications don't tend to be a hypo risk for people living with type 2 diabetes. However, it's still that 15 gram fast acting carbohydrate. So that would be six or seven jelly beans, 120 mils of fruit juice, for example, three teaspoons of sugar. So we want to check the levels again 10 to 15 minutes later. If they um, have gone up above the four millimoles and towards five, we know we can have a slowly absorbed carbohydrate snack. And that would be something like a cup of milk, a piece of fruit, or a couple of wheat picks, for example. However, if, for example, they didn't come back up after the 10 to 15 minutes, we would repeat step one again, okay? So the fast-acting carbohydrate gets us out of the danger zone and the long-acting carbohydrate helps us remain out of that danger zone and dropping back down. All right, that's the end of the webinar today. Thanks very much for listening in. If you have any further questions, remember we do have the NDSS helpline which can be accessed on the number below.